Hi, I'm Anna, and I'm presenting on Minaruyasu. Um, so Minoru Yasui was a Japanese American born in Hood River in 1916. In 1939, he became one of the first Japanese Americans to graduate from the University of Oregon School of Law and the first Japanese American member of the Oregon Bar. Um, he became part of history by questioning if the military's curfew on Japanese Americans during World War II followed the rules of the Constitution. Um, the intro basically discusses how fear and prejudice against Japanese people increased in the U.S. after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, and to deal with this fear, the government passed laws that restricted the movements of Japanese Americans through curfews and later gave military leaders the power to remove Japanese Americans from certain areas through Executive Order 9066, regardless of their citizenship status. These laws led to the forced relocation of Japanese Americans, including both, both those that were born in Japan, the Issei, and those that were born in the U.S., the Nisei, um, to internment camps, which are basically places where people are detained, um, usually during war, based on their ethnicity, nationality, or perceived threat, and they often involve restrictions on movement and basic freedoms. Uh, Minori, Minoru Yasui and other Japanese Americans tried to challenge um, these laws in court, but the Supreme Court basically said the laws were okay. And um, even though they went through a lot of tough times, none of the Japanese Americans were actually ever proven to have done any sabotage or spying during the war. So persuasion seeking through argument and appeals in the introduction. So the first quote is on page 303, and it reads, all people of 116th Japanese descent or more were evacuated and removed to internment camps. Thus, not only were the Issei, those that were born in Japan, subject to incarceration in the camps, but so were the Nisei, those who were born in the US and were American citizens. Um, so, this quote talks about how Japanese Americans were sent to camps during World War II. It begins by saying that all people of 116th Japanese descent um, or more were evacuated to internment camps. It says that even those that were born in Japan and the American citizens born in the U.S. were put in camps, which shows how the policy affected all Japanese Americans, regardless of their birthplace or citizenship. Um, and then the school also talks about how unfair the treatment was for both the Issei and the Nisei people, which is you know, like going to the appeal side of it. Um, it shows that the internment policy didn't care if someone was an immigrant or born in the U.S. They were all treated the same. Um, so this is unfair because it targeted people based on their Japanese background and not because they did anything wrong or posed a threat. So the injustice is clear um, when even those born in the U.S. lost their rights just because of their Japanese heritage. And then the second quote on page 304 reads, although wartime hysteria cost so many Japanese Americans their homes, occupations, and self-esteem, not one case of espionage or sabotage was brought against any of them. So this second quote shows that despite the government saying internment was needed for security reasons, there was no proof that Japanese Americans were a threat. Despite fears during war, not one Japanese American was found guilty of spying or sabotage. This points out how unfair the internment policy was because innocent people were imprisoned just because of their ethnicity without any evidence of wrongdoing. It highlights the internment was based on unjust suspicions and racism and not any actual security issues. Um, for appeals, the court also goes to appeals based on people's sense of fairness by showing how unjustly the Japanese Americans were treated during World War II. It points out that despite prejudice and discrimination, there was no evidence of Japanese Americans being spies or damaging anything. And this challenges the government's actions and suggests that innocent people were wrongly targeted. It encourages people to question the internment policies. And by emphasizing that there's no actual threat posed by the Japanese Americans, 
Um, the quote draws out empathy from the audience, making them recognize the injustice of the situation and making them advocate for fair treatment and equal rights for all people, regardless of their ethnicity or background. So persuasion seeking through argument and appeals on um, reflection on Executive Order 9066. Um, so first, basically, Executive Order 9066 was signed by Pre President Franklin D. Roosevelt in February of 1942. And it allowed military areas to be set up and certain people to be kept out. Um, and the order let the Secretary of War and military leaders pick the area that they felt was in, that they felt were important for security, and they were able to decide um, who could be there. And those areas could cover whole cities or even whole states. Um, people of Japanese descent, whether they were citizens or not, were the main targets of this order. It affected both the Issei and the Nisei, the Japanese immigrants and the Japanese Americans born in the U.S. Um, under this order, they were forced to leave designated areas and move to internment camps um, further away. And this was really sudden and chaotic, and it tore up a lot of families and communities from their homes and businesses. And they didn't even really have much of a chance to argue against being excluded or to even try to prove their loyalty to America. So Yasui was thinking about the time that he refused to follow Executive Order 9066, and he was pretty shocked by how much power the military had over regular people. He felt like going along with it would mess up everyone's rights. Um, so he decided not to evacuate, which ended up getting him arrested. Um, but later he got put into the internment camp along with the other Japanese Americans, and they were then later sent to desert camps with barbed wires and guards with guns, and Gasly and the others were really worried about what might happen next, and thinking that they might end up in bad situations like the labor camps in Germany at that time. Um, this part shows how Gasly really struggled with standing up against unfair orders and how guys like Westbrook Tegler um, spread hate and fear against Japanese Americans, making things worse for them during World War II. So the first quote that I have on here is on page 304. And it basically reads, the thing that struck me immediately was that the military was ordering the civilian to do something. In my opinion, that's the way dictatorships are formed. And if I, as an American citizen, stood, for, stood still for this, I would be derogating the rights of all citizens. So this quote is mostly arguing a point, and it's saying that Yasui thinks the military's orders are like those of a dictatorship and would violate people's rights. Um, he's trying to convince people that these orders would only hurt everyone's rights. So then in the second quote, um, on page 304, it reads, I was thrown into the North Portland Livestock Pavilion where Japanese Americans had been put. In September, they started moving us into desert camps. We were surrounded with barbed wire fences. There were armed guards, searchlights, and machine gun nests. We wondered how long we were going to be there. What was going to happen, no one knew. By then, we had heard rumors of forced labor camps in Germany. Um, were they indeed, as Westbrook Pegler and the others were suggesting, going to castrate the men and ship them back to Japan? These things were in the paper constantly, make them suffer, make them hurt, and you keep thinking, what did I do? So this quote basically does two things. Um, it tries to make you feel for the Japanese Americans by describing how tough things were for them during the internment, with the scary rumors like the castration and forced labor thrown in, and at the same time, it kind of argues that treating Japanese Americans that way was just like really plain wrong, highlighting how cruel and baseless the rumors were and how innocent people got hurt because of them. Um, so this slide, I basically have a picture from one of the World War II internment camps. Um, and this is basically my primary source, and it adds visual context to the article, um, helping us understand the historical setting and significance of Yasui's actions a little bit better. Um, it shows the harsh reality of life for Japanese Americans in the internment camps, um, pretty much matching the descriptions in the article with the barbed wire fences and confinement. Um, and it also brings out emotion by showing the individuals, um, families, and children that were imprisoned there behind the barbed wires, making us connect more deeply with the hardships that were described in the article. Um, resistance analysis. So basically, in this part, Yasui looks back on his fight against discrimination during World War II because of his Japanese background. 
At first, when he was told to join the U.S. Army, he had trouble buying a train ticket because of his because of his ethnicity. Um, even though he had a position in the army, he couldn't get a ticket until he mentioned his rights under the Constitution. Then, on March 28th of 1942, um, he broke the curfew for Japanese Americans on purpose in order to protest against the unfair treatment. Um, as a lawyer, he knew it was important to challenge the unfairness right away um, to avoid any problems later. So by breaking the curfew, he wanted to show how Japanese Americans were being treated unfairly and to stand up for the idea that everyone should be treated the same under the law, um, no matter where they're from. So his choice to get arrested for breaking the curfew was kind of a form of civil disobedience. He did it to fight against unfair policies and make people more aware. So by openly disobeying the curfew and agreeing to go to jail, he drew attention to the unfair policies and gave a legal reason to challenge them. Um, his actions showed resistance to injustice and were meant to defend the rights of all Americans, no matter where they came from. Um, even when pressured to follow evacuation orders, he stuck to his beliefs in fighting against unfair treatment, even if he had to comply reluctantly. So when he was taken to the internment camp in Portland, um, he said that he would cooperate, but only because he felt, he felt forced to. Um, this showed that he was willing to follow the military's orders, but he didn't really agree with them. Um, by saying that he would only go under coercion, um, he made it clear that he didn't agree with the evacuation orders and he was just following them because he had to, which just shows how tough it was for the Japanese Americans during that time. Um, even though he strongly disagreed with the policies, he knew he had to follow them to avoid getting in more trouble with the military or police. So when the military took him to North Portland Livestock Pavilion on May 12th in 1942, um, he went along with them, like he said he would, and he still didn't give up his beliefs though. Um, he followed the orders, but he did it while protesting against the unfair treatment of Japanese Americans and trying to protect their rights and dignity. So he then talks about his tough time in the internment camps um, where he was treated badly and he said he wasn't even given things like basic hygiene. Um, and even though he was locked up, he still wanted to find a way to fight in the war and join the military, um, but he was refused. And he also really wanted to see his family again, who he hadn't seen in a long time. And it was really hard for him to get permission to have a leave. But eventually, after a lot of struggle, he finally got it. And then later, he meets a young Japanese American who refuses to join the craft because he thinks the government is treating his family really unfairly, which I think is a really good example of how her and confused a lot of Japanese Americans probably felt at that time and how tough the positions were for them. Uh, persuasion seeking through argument and resistance. So the first quote on page 306 reads, I immediately volunteered for the infantry and many months later was advised that I had been rejected. So in that first quote, he wanted to join the military even though he was in prison. And the quote suggests an argument because it shows how he tried to join, but he got rejected, which suggests that he was unfairly treated because of his Japanese background and not because of his ability or willingness to serve because he was obviously really willing. Um, and the second quote on page 305 reads, the principle involved was whether the military could single out a specific group of U.S. citizens on the basis of ancestry and require them to do something not required of other U.S. citizens. So that basically took place when he decided to break the curfew um, meant for Japanese Americans in Portland, saying that it wasn't fair to treat people differently based on their background. He thought that it was important to speak up against unfairness right away um, to avoid problems later. And by getting arrested and breaking the curfew, he wanted to show how Japanese Americans were being treated unfairly. So persuasion seeking through appeals and resistance. Um, on page 306, the quote reads, the guards would not let me out long enough to take a bath or get a haircut or shave. At the end of several months, I was thinking dirty. Although I tried to wash myself in the washroom with rags, my hair was growing long and shaggy, um, and unkempt and tangled. 
My facial hair was growing in all directions, untrimmed, and my nails were growing so long they had begun to curl over on themselves, both on my hands and my feet. I found I could chew off my fingernails, but the nails on my toes gave me trouble. It was not until after Christmas that I was given permission to take a bath and get a haircut and shave. And at that time, it seemed like such a luxury. So basically, he's describing his experiences and challenges um, during his time in jail after being sentenced by Judge James Allegrafi and the harsh conditions and mistreatment that he faced in that time. So here kind of appeals to, to a emotional and sensory appeal. So I think he appeals to an emotional appeal by the descriptions of his deteriorating physical condition due to the unjust confinement. Um, and I feel like that is going to bring out a lot of empathy from his audience. So he describes his unkempt appearance, untrimmed facial hair, um, overgrown nails, um, and it shows the harshness and inhumanity of his treatment. So readers are probably going to feel a lot of sympathy for him as they imagine what he's experienced during his imprisonment. And then for sensory appeal, he um, basically details the sensory experiences of his confinement. Um, such as the unpleasant smell, the feeling of, of the unkempt hair, the discomfort of overgrown nails. Um, all that sensory imagery allows readers to imagine the conditions that he was in, um, making a stronger emotional response and more empathy towards his unjust confinement. Statement upon sentencing 1942 analysis. So in his statement, Yasui thanks the court for defending the rights of American citizens, even in difficult times. Um, he strongly believes in the importance of American values, like democracy and freedom, and he trusts that the court will uphold these values. Um, he talks about his loyalty to the U.S. and his willingness to serve in the military as proof of his patriotism. He contrasts this with the unfair treatment that he received um, as an inter-Japanese American. He also condemns Japanese actions in attacking Pearl Harbor and Manila, um, and emphasizes his alignment with American values. Despite facing personal consequences, he respects the court's decision and sees it as brave, um, as a brave stand for democracy and freedom. Overall, his statement shows his deep commitment to American ideals and his determination to fight against injustice, even when it's difficult. So persuasion seeking to argument in statement upon seeking. So on page 307, there's a quote that reads, despite the circumstances, I am compelled to pay tribute and give my unreserved respect to this honorable court for its clear cut and courageous reaffirmation of the inviolability of the fundamental civil rights and liberties of an American citizen. So here Yasui uses persuasion through argument by acknowledging and praising the court's defense of civil rights and liberties um, he's basically expressing his respect and gratitude toward the court um, for affirming the importance of fundamental civil rights and liberties. And although it might seem like a simple gesture, um, it's also a really strategic argumentative move. He's basically emphasizing the significance of these rights and implying that his actions were aimed at defending them. Um, and then by praising the court's stance in civil rights, he is subtly suggesting that his actions were in line with the broader societal values and ideals. And by doing so, he tries to appeal to the court's sense of justice and align his cause with the widely held beliefs about the importance of protecting civil liberties. So while the statement might appear to just be a show of respect, it's actually a way for him to frame his actions within the context of defending fundamental rights and therefore strengthening his case in the eyes of the court. Um, persuasion seeking through appeals in statement of sentencing, 1942. So on page 307, the quote reads, for I would a thousand times prefer to die on the battlefront as an American soldier in defense of freedom and democracy for the principles which I believe, rather than to live in relative comfort as an interned alien chap. So here he uses emotional appeals to evoke sympathy and support from the court and public. He basically emphasizes his deep sense of allegiance and loyalty to the US, which he really did have. Um, and he portrayed himself as a really dedicated patriot willing to sacrifice his own well-being for the greater good. So by highlighting the indignity of being labeled an alien Jap and then contrasting it with his willingness to fight and die for his country, 
he appeals to the preservation. Um, he, he appeals to the audience's sense of empathy and then appeals to the court's sense of duty and honor, praising their courageous stand for the preservation of democracy and freedom. And through these appeals, he tries to gain sympathy and support for his cause and hopes to mitigate the severity of his sentence. Um, letters from jail analysis. So in these letters to his sister Yuka, Yasui basically talks about his time in jail and what he believes in. Even though he's locked up, he still believes in American democracy and still thinks that the Supreme Court will agree with him. Um, he mentions how patriotic your dad was and how he feels a duty to stand up for American values, especially when unfair things happen, like the Japanese Americans being put in camps. He's disappointed that he can't appeal his case quickly and he hopes to get out on conditions so that he can help out in society. Even though the legal step is slow and hard, he's determined to make sure that his rights as an American are recognized. Um, in, his, in his letters, he also teaches his little sister important things like how to understand and stand up for democracy, even when things are tough, like the situation they're in where they're put in camps. So persuasion seeking through argument in letters from jail. Um, on page 308, there's a quote that reads, the insidious danger of creating a precedent of confining American citizens behind barbed wire fences and machine guns when they have committed no crime seem reprehensible to me. Perhaps the analogy is far-fetched, but surely the attack on Pearl Harbor endangered, endangered our democracy. Um, evacuation of American citizens on the basis of race is just as dangerous a threat to democracy. So basically, in this quote, he's logically comparing how imprisoning the citizens because of their race is similar to the attack in Pearl Harbor, um, where both are bad for democracy. He points out how it goes against American principles to lock up people who haven't done anything wrong and showing why he thinks the government's actions are unfair. Um, persuasion seeking through appeals in letters from jail. So he says on page 309, I feel and I know that Caucasian Americans are no, no better nor worse than I, for we are all human beings. It is only the principles of liberty, democracy, and justice, and the adherence to these principles that made America great. And as a loyal American who can suffer his native land to do no wrong, I must hold true to these principles. Um, obviously, we are regarded with suspicion and distrust, but can we call ourselves worthy Americans if we tolerate the destruction of those eternal truths of America without an effort to preserve them? Um, so here, basically, Yasui is appealing to the values of equality, liberty, democracy, and justice, um, trying to urge everyone to see each other as fellow Americans, um, no matter what their background. He stresses the duty to defend these values and questions if we can actually be proud to um, the Americans if we don't stand up for what's right. He's trying to persuade his audience to fight against injustice by showing the importance of protecting America's core principles. Um, so how is the peace responsive to a situation? So um, it can be seen as responsive to a situation in several ways. Um, for one, the article is written in response to the historical events that are surrounding the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, in particular, the Executive Order 9066. Uh, Yasui's personal experiences and reflections are shaped by the circumstances of the time, including the widespread anti-Japanese sentiment and the government's discriminatory policies. Um, and that's just one way. And then another way is that um, Yasui's actions, such as deliberately violating curfew orders and refusing to comply with evacuation orders, can be seen as responses to the unjust treatment of Japanese Americans um, by the government. His decision to challenge these policies through legal means, including taking his case to the Supreme Court, shows his responsiveness to the situation. And then another way is that through his writings and actions, he engages in a moral and ethical response to the violation of civil liberties and human rights. He communicates um, the principles of democracy, justice, and equality, and his efforts to defend these principles can be seen as a direct response to the injustices 
that were faced by the Japanese Americans um, during that period. And then these are my references. Thank you for listening.